Um, so welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for this virtual event. Um, we're so pleased to have Christian Picciolini with us along with his colleague, Nora Flanagan, to discuss their efforts confronting hate groups in this country. Um, my name is Rachel Garcia. I'm a librarian at Wilmette Public Library. We're proud to bring you this event as part of our ongoing dedication to racial justice programming. A big thank you to Sherry Simpson of the Montgomery Travelers who suggested we host Christian and always provides us with excellent ideas for racial justice programs. Uh, just a few housekeeping points to mention before we begin. This is a webinar, which means you can see and hear us, but we cannot and see we cannot see and hear you, but you do, however, have the ability to submit questions to Christian and Nora using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to submit a question as soon as you think of it. You don't need to wait until our Q&A segment, which will be after Christian and Nora's discussion. Um, of course, we'll not be able to answer all of your questions, but we will do our very best. Um, I also want to mention we've partnered with the bookstall to sell copies of Christian's latest book, Breaking Hate. Please support our local indie bookstore and place your order through their website. That information, along with some excellent resources Christian and Nora have provided, can be found on a web page we've created for this event. A follow-up email sent out tomorrow will direct you to that page. So now I'd like to introduce you to our speakers. Um, Christian Picciolini is an award-winning television producer, a public speaker, author, peace advocate, and a former violent extremist. After leaving the hate movement he helped create during the 1980s and 90s, he began the painstaking process of making amends and rebuilding his life. Christian went on to earn a degree in international relations from DePaul University and launched Gold Mill Group a counter-extremism consulting and digital media firm. In 2016, he won an Emmy Award for producing an anti-hate advertising campaign aimed at helping people disengage from extremism. Since leaving the white power movement, Christian has dedicated his life to helping others overcome their own hate. He now leads the Free Radicals Project, a global extremism prevention and disengagement network. He has spoken all over the world, including the TED stage, and shares his unique and extensive knowledge, teaching all who are willing to learn about building greater peace through empathy and compassion. Christian chronicles his involvement and exit from the early American white supremacist skinhead movement in his memoir, White American Youth. He showcases his disengagement work in a second book, Breaking Hate, Confronting the New Culture of Extremism, published in February 2020 by Hachette Books, as well as the MSNBC documentary series of the same name. With him tonight is Nora Flanagan. Nora is a veteran high school English teacher in Chicago and has researched and organized against racism for decades. Her efforts have included speaking to law enforcement and other government agencies, school administrations, community groups, and media outlets, about the intersection of bigotry and youth culture. Nora is also a senior fellow with the Western State Center, a nonprofit organization based in Portland, Oregon, working nationally to confront hate groups and strengthen inclusive democracy. She recently co-authored Confronting White Nationalism in Schools, a toolkit designed to help schools thoughtfully and effectively and effectively respond to incidents of racial hostility and proactively strengthen school communities. We welcome you both. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us tonight. Um, I'm done with my spiel, so I will hand it over to you both. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Rachel. Um, Christian, do you mind if I start right away with a question? No, not at all, Nora. Okay. Um, so what Rachel didn't mention is that um, Christian and I have known each other and known of each other for 30 years. Um, okay. Yes, uh, the start of my organizing work was when Christian was active in an extremist group and we're both from the same neighborhood. So that's how far back we go. And now we do this work on the same side of the issue and every once in a great while we get to speak together. So thank you, Rachel, and thank you, um, to the public library for hosting us because I, I enjoy these conversations and I 
I'm excited to talk about this, especially right now, because we planned this event months ago, not realizing that we would be speaking uh, with each other and to you know a couple hundred people um, a week after a siege on our nation's capital. So my first question is, in this very moment, if you could cut through all the noise, because there is so much that people are trying to play catch up about, trying to understand, trying to get their heads around with regard to extremism and its, and its role in that siege. If you could cut through the noise and get one distilled idea through to people uh, who are concerned about this issue, what would that one idea be? What's one thing you would want to help people understand right now? Yeah, thanks, Nora. <clears throat> and let me first just say, you know, I'm grateful to be here and privileged to be here. You know, we're still living in a, in a country and a nation where uh, people that, you know, don't look like me are, are not getting first chances. And here I am with second and maybe even third chances. So I want to acknowledge that. And that's something that I work uh, every day to try and, and, and uh, balance the equity um, so that everybody is getting a fair shot. But I want to answer your question. Um, you know, first, I want to say I'm terrified in this moment right now because I you know, I still remember uh, what it's like to be one of them. I remember the mindset of, uh, you know, of, of thinking that every day was, you know, one day closer to a race war, uh, of thinking that, you know, it was all going to come down and that this was, you know, a very short life that I was going to live because I was willing to dedicate it all to, you know, a really toxic cause. So I still remember, you know, what it was like to think that way. Um, so I understand how, you know, maybe the, the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of people, you know, who have that same mindset that, that I used to have 30 years ago uh, are feeling in this moment. They're trained every day uh, through propaganda, through indoctrination, whether it's through music or literature or websites or social media. Um, that, you know, it's kind of the end times that are coming, that it, within their lifetime, they are going to have to make a, you know, a difficult choice uh, to leave their families and go fight this race war. Yeah. It's kind of where we are in this moment right now. It's in their DNA. It's, it is their canon of literature. It is, you know, their propaganda is, has been preparing them for, for this very, very moment. Um, and uh, to think that what we saw, you know, happen a week ago, uh, and how close we came to very literally losing our democracy you know, so closely uh, because there were people there that had intentions of hurting people uh, and certainly, you know, uh, even worse. Um, I think, you know, we, we nearly, very nearly averted a, you know, a massacre. Right. So to cut through it all, to kind of give you the gist of what's going on is we're still having the debate on whether they're extremists or not they know full well that they are. They know exactly uh, what this moment is, is telling them to do. And we are still uh, very frustratingly debating uh, whether what we're seeing is, is reality. Let me just tell you uh, to kind of put a, a punctuation on, on the end of that is, um, you know, what we're seeing right now is a very, very important moment. Uh, and I always tell my wife, and maybe I've even said it to you, Nora, is we're at, at the moment where this, this snake uh, that we're dealing with, you know, if, if we don't cut the head off the snake now, uh, we're going to be dealing with something much, much more devastating very soon. Uh, and, even, and I think uh, Reverend Warnock said this recently, and it was a quote that stuck with me. And he says, even if you cut the head off the snake, know that the body is going to kind of, with, you know, move around violently after you cut its head off, but that means it's dying. It doesn't mean it's able to terrorize anymore. So I think we're, we're at an important moment where we need to cut this head off the snake. We need to hold people accountable for what's happened. And we need to send a very strong message that this is not acceptable and move in a direction where we fix the systemic institutional racism that creates this problem that we're in right now. So that actually leads really well into my next question, because here's your book. Breaking Hate. I have my copy with me. S highly recommend. If, if folks haven't already made arrangements to get their hands on a copy, I really recommend you get to it now, as well as Christian's first book, White American Youth. Because if you're watching any of this unfold, if you're, if 
you're if you're seeing and hearing from these uh, people who are part of these extremist groups and 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 taking these violent actions and wondering how does someone get from point A to point B, both of Christian's books do a really good job of not just explaining it but humanizing it. And so I wanna I wanna ask you a question about breaking hate specifically. Yeah. Um, multiple subjects in your book seem to grapple with uh, the push and pull between like scope and consequences. Um, there's a man named Koval, am I saying that correctly? Yeah. Who, who asks literally in these exact words, how did it get this far? Like, how did I get to this point? And, and even when you talk about Dylan Roof, he considered himself, you know, unredeemable and there was no going back. There's this, there's this description of the momentum of this movement. So my question would be, how do you explain that runaway sense of how did I get here? And, and what can we do to either abate or reverse it when someone feels like they are tumbling so fast down that path that they just not only can't stop themselves, but maybe no one else can stop them either? Yeah, I think that that's a really important question. Um, I think it's important to understand that most people, in fact, I would say probably all people don't gravitate towards that movement initially because of the ideology. Nobody, you know, wakes up not knowing about it and says, hey, that looks really interesting. I'm going to go hate people. I think it's, a, you know, it, it is a process. Uh, and I talk about it in the book. Um, you know, it isn't, if it isn't the ideology that's, that's the initial pull, what is it? Well, we're all on a search for identity, community, and purpose in our lives. Oftentimes when we're, you know, younger in our teenage years, when we're starting to move away from the influence of our parents, uh, but I'm also, and I'll preface that with an asterisk, I also see it now in uh, middle age as people are retiring. We can talk about that and how older people are now becoming radicalized. Um, but along that journey, searching for identity, community, and purpose, we all hit what I call potholes in our life. Uh, and potholes are things like trauma, uh, it could be grief, loss, uh, poverty, even privilege. Privilege, if it keeps us, you know, too separate uh, from humanity, it, you know, it can be a pothole that leads us to the fringes. Uh, but there are all sorts of things and there are millions of different things that can happen to us in our lives that, that cause us to kind of be t detoured off to the fringes where these narratives are really, really prevalent. And there are all sorts of narratives there, right? Toxic narratives uh, are the loudest. They scream and, and they tend to have a lower bar of who they accept. So somebody who maybe has been, has felt marginalized or, uh, you know, is lonely and they're more vulnerable to those types of narratives because they are very accepting and they do fulfill a sense of identity, community, and purpose. So, you know, on the reverse of that, how do we pull people out if we see them going in that direction is we have to become pothole fixers and we have to replace, uh, we have to replace toxic identity, community, and purpose with, with positive identity, community, and purpose. And I talked about older people kind of falling, uh, you know, in that trap as well. You know, we're talking about people in their 50s and 60s. We saw them at the Capitol. There were a lot of people, you know, it wasn't young people, it wasn't teenagers there. It wasn't, you know, what we would think were the average protesters. These were people, you know, some who were retired. Uh, and if we think about retired people or people that age, they have a whole lifetime of potholes, divorce and loss. Uh, they've, you know, maybe lost their job. Maybe they've just retired and they're moving to a new state and they've got to redevelop a whole sense of community and, and identity and purpose. And they're really susceptible because let's face it, our parents and people that age and, and even people my age are living on Facebook where these narratives uh, you know, are, are, let's face it, kind of overtaking the normal narratives of our life. Uh, and uh, and we are we're living in a time, unfortunately, where you know I don't I don't think there's a, a one of us on this meeting that can't say we haven't seen extremist propaganda or we haven't you know had to to kind of uh, you know talk down some fake news that somebody posted or you know a conspiracy or something like that. So it is all around us. When in my day, 30 years ago, when I was a 14 year old recruited in an alley, somebody had to hand me a pamphlet. It was that kind of fringy, kooky guy. Who, who would talk about the conspiracy theories. And it was really limited to that group of people. And you know, now, unfortunately, the internet has made it so you know, it's available to all of us. So I know that you and I have both been getting a lot of questions about adults being susceptible to extremist mm -hmm. propaganda. So I would say that's one of the biggest misconceptions about who is susceptible. 
what is another, what is another like misdiagnosis in your mm. experience, in your opinion, as far as who is vulnerable? Yeah, I mean, I think we're all vulnerable, right? I think it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you're from a, you know, a lower class or an upper class, or, if, you know, if you have means or if you don't have means, if you come from poverty or, or, or if you don't. Um, I think education level doesn't matter. I think that it's the, it's the life experiences and those potholes that I talk about, whether it's you know trauma, loss, mental illness, a million different things that can happen to us in our in our lifetimes that are difficult to navigate around. Um, those are the instances that can cause us to kind of lose our way. We often talk about like I can't believe it that person seemed so normal. I was you know they were fine last year when I talked to them, and now all of a sudden they're posting these crazy things in their lives. And I think if you dig down into those instances, you'll find that maybe in that last year, there were certain life experiences that happened to that person that maybe just caused them to, you know, shift where their perspective was. Uh, and they were susceptible then to, to kind of these narratives that filled those voids of what they were uncertain about. Uh, and that's a, that's a really important word. And I want to talk about uncertainty because I think uncertainty is the one ingredient that is causing all of this to occur. We're dealing with a pandemic, we're dealing with protests, we're dealing with an election that uh, you know, is, is nothing like we've ever seen before. Now we're dealing with you know, a, an insurgency or an insurrection at, you know, in the Capitol building. We are dealing with layer upon layer upon layer of uncertainty in our lives right now from unemployment and, and job loss to everything else. This is, this is when extremism flourishes. These are when these lottery ticket ideas that you know, if you're thinking logically, don't make a whole lot of sense. But if maybe all of a sudden you need to help, you need help making sense of the things that don't make sense in your life, those things, you know, even though they're false, will help you do that. And it's, uh, that's kind of the moment we're in right now. I want to ask you a question. Can I ask you a question, Nora? Okay. First, I want to say, Nora, you were one person who helped me with my book, White American Youth, when I was writing a memoir. So thank you very much. And I want to tell that story because it was important. And you can chime in anytime you want, because I think when I emailed you out of the blue, after decades, maybe two decades of, or, you know, decade and a half of, of us having seen each other across very, you know, different lines, I emailed you out of the blue and I said, Nora, uh, I don't know if you remember me or not, uh, but I'm writing a book and I really would love the perspective of somebody who was there, but maybe saw it from, from you know, a different way that oh. I I'm going to stop you right there uh, because <laughs> you would. Yep. First of all, um, great job because this is actually something someone already asked about in the Q and A. So we're we're already getting to a couple of those, um, which was how did we end up working together? Um, so the I don't know if you remember me. Um, that's funny, but also not because yeah. the whole reason I started organizing against uh, hate groups was because of Christian. We're from the same part of the far Southwest side. I'm born in Blue Island, raised in Beverly, uh, Christian as well. Born in Blue Island, right? Born in Blue Island, raised yeah. in Blue Island. Yeah. Um, so we lived like literal, pretty much blocks away from each other. We had overlapping kind of circles of friends um, that went in very different political directions. So Christian, uh, and I, I've said this in other interviews before, Christian's the reason that I carried a bat a baseball bat in my trunk in high school because things got rough. I mean, it was, it was a really tense time and a really tense place. And so for Christian to email me and say, I don't know if you remember me was ridiculous. Uh, so anyway, carry on. This is my, this is my way of you getting to tell your story yeah. a little bit. Of your yeah. mm. um, but as a teacher, as somebody who has taught for many years in Chicago public schools, um, you are on the front lines of oftentimes of kind of, I don't want to say diagnosing this, but seeing the signs of young people who might be going off in these directions. I want to know from you as somebody who has fought hate for all of her life, but also, you know, been a teacher and somebody who, who, who's shaping minds. What are the things that you see most um, in young people who might be going in that direction? Um, it's funny because I was actually starting to think about this while you were speaking a few minutes ago about, you know, these misconceptions of who's susceptible. In the work that I've done now around this toolkit and with the Western State Center, I have talked to every possible school setting, small town, 
affluent private school uh, in a big city, uh, big affluent North Shore suburban district. Like these issues are coming up everywhere. They're coming up at the schools that we consider oases of diversity. Um, so there's no one type and there's no one scenario. But one of the things I enjoyed about, like that I appreciated about Breaking Hate was that you talk about, you know, this loss of identity, this loss of a sense of community, this loss of a sense of purpose that can happen to anyone. Everyone needs those things. They look different for everyone. So, you know, an affluent white student at a North Shore suburban high school might feel that he is losing his identity, might feel that he is losing his relevance, his sense of purpose in society as he has understood it so far. I mean, that's every bit as likely as the kind of assumption that it's no, 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 it's working, working class white people in the South or in rural communities. That is an old trope that is no longer applicable because it's everywhere. So what you want to look for is a kid who seems detached, a kid who seems increasingly resentful. Um, I've talked to a number of um, female identifying teachers who we sometimes sense at first as a hostility toward women teachers. And we'll talk to our male colleagues. We'll be like, this kid, a lot of, a lot of attitude from that kid. What's going on? Oh, really? We're not getting it. So we watch for gender hostility. We watch for hostility toward LGBTQ plus folks, because that can be one of the earlier uh, signs and kind of frankly, recruitment pipelines is, is homophobia and transphobia. Yeah. But those aren't limited to class and they're not limited geographically. So for the folks also in the Q&A that we're asking, like, what can we look for? Look for a sense of detachment and resentment and increasing isolation. Um, and teachers can see it, parents can see it, but maybe we're each seeing a small piece. Mm. So one of the things I always say too is if you're wondering, if you're starting to worry, reach out to the other people who interact with this kid and ask what they're seeing. That's one of the first things I always do. Yeah, those are really important indicators, the misogyny especially, and, and, and uh, the gender, uh, you know, very specific stuff is always a really early indicator. I would even take it a little bit further than that. If you're a parent, obviously, you know, divorce, loss, you know, so many times I'm, I'm dealing with people who I'm helping disengage where I, I'm going back to the time they were five and six years old and they discovered their father had committed suicide or, um, you know, their parents were divorced and there's still 15, you know, years later, this really bitter you know, animosity be, between them. And, and, and I kind of follow the potholes back as far back as they take me. And oftentimes I find that it, that it starts earlier before they even start manifesting the, you know, the isolation and things like that. And, um, uh -huh. yeah, so maybe that's, that's something parents can be more aware of anytime there are, you know, these kind of traumatic, uh, you know, childhood experiences for kids or adult experiences. Those are really important times to pay attention, to make sure that they're surrounded by care, that they're surrounded by people that they can talk to in a very safe place. Uh, to understand what they're going through. This is this is how we beat this, by the way. Going, you know, this is how we de-radicalize people before they even become radicalized. Is we provide these safe places uh, and mechanisms for people to to navigate these potholes, to to heal and to stay connected. Uh, because it's not until they become disconnected from other things that they start to really kind of you know move towards towards that. And I think we need to talk a little too about networks um, hmm. because. Again, in, in trying to address these before they are crisis level issues, when we start seeing a student or, or, or a kid in our lives, or frankly, an adult in our lives for that matter, start to detach and start to disconnect and isolate and, and I don't know, just seem different is how a lot of people explain it. They just seem different. Um, we want to reach out to networks uh, in that person's life too often a parent doesn't want to approach the school and say, I'm worried about my kid because mm -hmm. they're worried about jeopardizing their future or, or, I don't know, giving the school a bad impression. Sometimes the school is reluctant to reach out to a parent or teachers are nervous to talk to each other about this uh, or other, you know, youth leaders like coaches or, or uh, faith leaders. Nobody, we're, we're too conditioned to not get in each other's business about our kids that we miss that opportunity to network in support of a young person who needs us. So another piece of pretty universal advice I give is get everybody talking. 
Yeah, and it takes a village. It does. Yeah, and if the first person you approach doesn't seem receptive and doesn't seem to be willing to have the conversation, go to somebody else. Uh, and that's especially true in schools because sometimes an admin is busy or the counseling office is swamped. Find somebody else to talk to, reach out to somebody else uh, because chances are your instinct is right that a kid needs some extra support. Yeah, and I would say don't stop trying either because oftentimes the first time around, they're not gonna be as open, uh, as vulnerable, um, you know, as interested in, in kind of letting down, you know, taking off that armor that they're wearing. Uh, so, you know, keep trying, let them know that, that, you know, it's an open door um, and oftentimes they will come back. Um, yeah, good advice. So related to that, people often ask both Christian and I, and I for uh, signs. What signs do I look for? What are the signs? Mm -hmm. I'd like to talk about before that. And especially yeah. now that so many young people are still learning either partly or all remote and we are certainly more socially isolated. So let's talk, not signs, let's talk inoculation. What yeah. can parents and other adults be doing to strengthen identity and community and purpose in young people during such an isolated time? Well, I think we should be, as you know, adults or parents or teachers, you know, I, I think we have this habit of prescribing solutions mm -hmm. to young people where, you know, maybe we just need to kind of listen and sit back and, and you know, kind of maybe corral or guide if, if we need to, uh, but really follow their lead. I think that, you know, we underestimate how smart, how dedicated, how motivated, how ambitious young people are, and how, you know, how smart they are. Um, and I, th I, I think we'll be really surprised if, if, if we start to empower young people, how much we'll actually learn from them. Uh, we were all young at one point. Uh, we all thought at that point we were the smartest ever. Um, we certainly were not, but, you know, it was that, it was that kind of drive, I think, to, to you know, to, to understand that, you know, maybe sometimes for young people, unfairly, we tamp down. Um, I would say we need to listen to them. Uh, we need to listen to them because they really have a lot to say, and it's important. Um, you know, during the Parkland shooting, for instance, it was young people who really led that charge that they had been fed up, that they had been so tired of being scared, um, you know, for their lives that, you know, talking about the trauma that, that they experienced when, you know, as adults, how can we understand what it's like? You know, anybody my age doesn't know what it's like or your age nor doesn't know what it's like to have shooting drills in school. And maybe you do because you're a teacher, but certainly sure as, do. yeah, you do as, as a teacher, but you know, as a student, I, we didn't have to do that. So I think that there are so many things that we can take cues from young people for, um, but, but I also think we can create, from the very beginning, safe places for them. Uh, and so it's not always reactive. I think we can be you know, more proactive in, in talking to our children and you know, having conversations that are only difficult because we haven't had them yet, right? And we don't have the answers for them. But if we start having these conversations, we will find the answers for them. Uh, but we have to have those conversations. Um, and I think that it's okay to let our children tell us who they are instead of us telling them who we think that they are. Um, and I think that if, if we can learn to do that a little bit, um, you know, maybe we'll, we can build a, you know, a future for them that, that is theirs, actually. Well, you can ask my 14-year-old son. I love awkward conversations between parents and children. I make him so miserable that way. Um, <laughs> So here's a, a question coming from me as both a parent and a teacher. This is something that we wrestle with in schools when we talk about discipline. And this is something that as parents is always on our minds. How do you find the balance between teaching consequences for one's actions and making sure kids know that they can make mistakes and come back from them? And I ask this on multiple levels and for multiple reasons. We are seeing folks who stormed the Capitol a week ago seem shocked that they're losing their jobs. Um, but at the same time, I'm in conversation with a former white nationalist who I used to specifically organize against. So while I initially, for, for those who, who don't know, emphatically declined Christian's request for my help, I eventually gave it some thought and realized people need to be able to find their way back if we want them out of these movements. So my question for you is, how do we find the balance between teaching consequences for actions, but still making sure people understand they can come back from this? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's simple. I mean, I think that redemption without accountability is simply privilege. There has to be that accountability for redemption to exist. Without it, it's not redemption. Uh, so I mean, you, people can come back from it. I just think that they're so afraid of doing the work to repair the damage that they've caused. Um, and, and I can tell you as somebody who's, who's you know, done that, attempted to do that for the better part of the last you know, 20 years, it's possible uh, if you're genuine about it. It's possible if you truly do the work. It's possible if you go into it knowing that you don't know everything and that every day is a learning experience and that if that we are going to make mistakes but if you do you have to keep moving forward and progressing and and not push back on those mistakes accept them uh own them uh and do better uh and not make those mistakes and, and learn from them and teach those mistakes and that's you know something that i've been adamant about for 20 years is you know the people that i work with and that i've worked with hundreds of people is they must one hold themselves accountable before anybody else does i held myself accountable i was i was never doxxed i was never you know granted this was before the internet and people like you knew who i was nora but i you know i i, I came to address my past because it was the right thing to do and because I knew I had to do that to try and, and make the world uh, a better place than I left it because I had left it in, in shambles, right? Not only my own life, I'm not even talking about my own life, I'm talking about the lives of other people. Uh, and you know, there were, there were people who you know, gave me that compassion when I didn't deserve it, who, who allowed me uh, their empathy when, when I hadn't even worked for it. Uh, but it was because they gave me that chance to work for it that I, that I was willing to work for it, unfortunately. I mean, I think that I had those people not given me a chance, I don't know that I'd be here right now. I don't know that I would have had the strength or even, you know, the courage or the foresight to, to, to walk in a, in a progressive manner. Uh, but it was because those people gave me a chance and I'm grateful for that. Uh, but I also knew that when they gave me that chance, it was on me, it wasn't on them. It wasn't their responsibility. They didn't need to give me that second chance. I didn't even deserve it. I hadn't worked for it at that point. So I knew at that point I had to work for it, that I had to make good on the risk that they had taken on me. Um, because the people who took the chance on me um, were people I had hurt in the past. They were, you know, if you read about it in either of my books, you know, it was, it was uh, Mr. Holmes at, at my old high school, the, the black security guard who, you know, whose life I made hell and, you know, threatened and was physical with and, and protested, you know, outside of the school long before these protests we're seeing now. And it's, and it was him who said, you know, there's something inside of you that you're not even seeing, but you're better than this. Uh, and I, you may not see it yet, but I see it. And, you know, you're going to promise me that, you know, you're going to, you're going to do something about it. And I, I had promised, but I didn't know what the hell I was doing. At the time. Yeah. But I worked at it and I had to work at it because it was the right thing to do. And because it was the only way I could be whole. I had to search for that, that positive sense of identity, community, and purpose. And I had to fill my own pot. Um, I'm going to ask you a totally, because we have about five or six minutes left for questions, and I have two that I want to make sure we get to. Of course. Um, so we have a new administration coming into the White House. Give them a to-do list on this issue. What do you want the new administration to put on their to-do list right now? All right. So if we're going to solve extremism in the United States, uh, we need uh, access to health care for everybody. We need to fix the systemic and institutional, we need to eliminate the systemic and institutional racism that exists because that's like a bigot spigot. It is creating an environment for racists to thrive. Uh, we need access to education. We need to bring equity. We need to have access to jobs. Uh, those are all the things that in the long run will get rid of all the uncertainty that is driving extremism. Okay. To do list like immediately, seeing that you know those things take time to kind of, of weed those problems out is we we need a task force focused on extremism uh, with a national program working through nonprofits on disengagement services uh, because we're going to be dealing with a, an issue of potentially you know either hundreds of thousands of people becoming radicalized you know as time goes on more and more or those people leaving these movements once they hit a wall 
and there will be no infrastructure in place to deal with those people. So they will move laterally to some other really toxic identity, community, and purpose, and we'll be dealing with them in some other iteration. Um, I also think that we need to, you know, really look at the problem that we're dealing with with law, uh, infiltration of law enforcement and the military. This is a problem I've been talking about for 20 years. In fact, I've been talking about it for 30 years when I was telling people to go into the military and in law enforcement when I was a neo-Nazi because that was the that was our strategy back then. We knew we had to blend into mainstream because we were it was too much of a liability to look and act and be seen as a Nazi. We knew we had to recruit the average American white supremacist or the average American racist in ways that didn't turn them off. So right up around the time I was getting out of the movement was when they were really doing a push hard to start to infiltrate, you know, uh, to get people to go into becoming cops and, and, and joining the military, but also to recruit police officers and people who were in the military, because let's face it, that's a, those are professions with lots of potholes where people have a very strong sense of identity, community, and purpose. And when they leave, they need to replace that. So they knew very well that, that being a militant, uh, you know, extremist was very similar to being, you know, a police officer or, you know, in the military in, in, in many ways. Um, so those are all the things that I think are very, very important uh, to do right now. And, and I hope that the next administration will do that because certainly the last administration uh, removed all the, you know, the safety nets for those things to exist. And I, I, I'm actually really hopeful that Congress is going to bring this up again, because did I see Representative Congresswoman uh, Ocasio-Cortez mentioning your testimony in one of her Instagram lives like last night? She did, I think, last night when she was talking about her experience in the Capitol. It also talked a little bit about uh, my testimony, and I and I gave a testimony on the Hill, um, you know, just last year, uh, where I talked about these problems, where I talked about the militia groups that were organizing, uh, where I talked about the transnational nature of this. We're going to start seeing what's happening in the U.S. now, also happening in other countries. We're going to start to see these groups start to organize. Uh, they've already organized. They're going to start to see them amass around. The same types of things we're seeing here. This is this is not just our problem. Um, yeah. well, I I hope that's a sign that this is. I mean, it never should have been off everybody's radar. And there's a whole lot of people. It's worth mentioning that. I mean, Christian is one of a number of people who work really hard on this issue and have been working on this issue before it was in the headlines. Before everybody's parents had heard of the Proud Boys. So my last question is, how can people support your work and how can they find out about other efforts along these lines so that they can get behind? Yeah, and thank you, Nora. You've, you've been doing it uh, longer than me. So you know, thank you for your efforts because I might not be here. We may not be having this conversation if it wasn't from, for pressure from people like you because I tell you what, it works. Uh, we should not be silent um, and we shouldn't be violent either because frankly, those are the two things that they love. Um, so how can people help? I think we're going to send out some links. And I think one of the most important uh, things was the toolkit that you created uh, that uh, if you haven't checked it out, I know you created it for teachers and for schools, but I think that parents, I think that psychologists, I think that, you know, social workers, anybody who has access to young people, frankly, anybody who has access to somebody who they think might be you know, moving in that direction can really, really benefit from the toolkit. It's the Western State Center uh, toolkit that Nora uh, co-authored and it's free uh, and it's, it's free. Totally free yes and there are other links too that that we're going to provide there are organizations that you know keep an eye on um you know for what they're doing because they're doing really good things in this space uh there are some articles on um uh, and books even mentioned about uh really important topics that maybe we didn't get a chance to dive really deep into but are highlighted because they, they have really good um advice there and i think uh, it is 7.39, and we were supposed to wrap up our conversation by 7.40. <laughs> you guys are great. Teachers can keep it on a schedule. <laughs> um, yeah, you guys are on top of it. Thank you, because we do have a lot of questions. Um, and I know you guys can see the questions, too, and, uh, you know, feel free to scroll through and look. But there is one that was emailed that I want to get you, and it's a good question. Um, sure. Someone asked, what do you wish the churches in the U.S. would do to combat extremism? We talked a little bit about, you know, networks in our schools. What about 
churches. Um, and then someone also asked, what do you make of the fact that there was a lot of Christian symbolism on display uh, last week at the Capitol? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, there's a long history of extremists, you know, being, you know, very extremist kind of uh, religious folks as well, you know, fundamentalists and things like that, uh, across all sorts of extreme. I mean, if we're talking about, uh, you know, extremism anywhere else in the world, the same is true there as well. Um, you know, I, they cozy up to it because, you know, there are some things that are adjacent, right? You know, there are... Uh, there are, you know, issues with openness, there are issues with tolerance, there are, you know, things being taught and that, you know, aren't quite as, as progressive maybe as the rest of the world. So I think that they cozy up to those things, knowing that there are some people in those environments that may be very, very afraid of change. And those are the folks they can. And this is by no means a statement of, of you know, religion or anybody, you know, who, who has, you know, a faith or anything like that. But, the, you know, like they go to you know the military to recruit people who have PTSD and and who you know don't have an outlet for their anger or their frustration when they come home from that stuff. They also look for people you know who are of faith who have become angry for some reason and their views have, have started to now need an outlet for for something more extreme. Uh, they also go to baking groups. <laughs> you know, let me just say that they go to you know to to organic. Um, you know, fruit markets and stuff like that, because they're trying to really recruit people who are going for more traditional lifestyles because they can appeal to kind of that isolationist thinking in, in some ways. Um, you know, they, they've always kind of cozied up to, to religion, knowing that there, are, there is a subset of people there that they may be able to attract and recruit. Um, but to faith groups, I would say, I, I think we need to start looking at our congregations and, and start thinking about how we are teaching uh, certain things and how maybe you know closed we are to certain progressive ideas that may be kind of a you know planting some of these seeds in people i would shout out to um some really great networking groups interfaith networking groups in and around chicago i've done a lot of work with uh, a group called the children of abraham coalition that gets together muslim and jewish and christian middle schoolers and high schoolers to i don't know on a school holiday, go on an outing, learn about each other's faith, uh, do service work together. I, I went to a, a 250 person potluck that they threw that was amazing. Uh, and just that outreach and, and working together and everyone keeping an eye on everybody is just such a huge part of it, of uh, combating that way that religion is used to keep us separate. So, I mean, the more we talk to each other, the less they can keep us apart. That's important. Always look for groups that, you know, focus on interfaith or pluralistic type things because, you know, the, the less isolated they are, uh, typically the more positive they focus. Thank you. Um, we also had quite a few questions about your analogy of cutting the head off of the snake. Mm -hmm. um, people want to know how do we cut the head off the snake? Who is the head? Um, and who's working on that? Is the FBI, I mean, I don't know if the current administration, you know, the efforts going on there, but um, uh, who's I, gonna I, be spearheading this effort? I, I don't think there is one head of the snake. I think that that's more of a metaphorical, you know, meaning the propagandists, the money people who are funding this, the ones who have the, the loudest megaphone, uh, you know, at this time, the president of the United, of the United States, who has, has done a very good job of, of, of uh, emboldening folks to commit acts of violence. Um, you know, that that is the head of the snake. So, you know, the ones who are the mobilizers, the influencers, um, uh, it's important to, to kind of cut their feet out from under them because um, they're the ones directing this. You know, if it wasn't for their voices, uh, for their, you know, their fake news, there wouldn't be, you know, potentially millions and millions of Americans who believe that Democrats are, you know, pedophile, Satan worshiping blood drinkers who are, you know, running, a, you know, some brothel in a, in a pizza place or something like that. Uh, I mean, th this is the level, and I say that, and it sounds ridiculous to most people here, but we're dealing with the reality that there are potentially millions and millions of Americans who subscribe to things like QAnon, uh, who believe exactly that. 
Um, so, you know, I think the reality is, is, is we need to, to look very, very hard at, you know, at, at who is putting this out there, who is planting the seeds. The body will eventually die. They, you know, we have to provide other outlets for them, positive identity, community, and purpose, or again, they'll go sideways or, or even backwards into something more, more negative. Um, but we can save this, right? We, we can save America and Americans. Uh, but we can also do that while holding people accountable for causing chaos, for trying to destroy democracy, and for committing hate crimes and terror on you know, Americans, not just for the last few years, but let's face it, for 400 years. Uh, these are the problems that we're dealing with. So I think that, you know, we have a very hard look in the mirror. Uh, you know, people aren't the only ones with potholes uh, in a search for identity, community, and purpose. Our nation is in a desperate search for identity, community, and purpose right now. And we have a whole history of potholes that we've never contended with. We have, you know, everything from slavery to Jim Crow to, you know, we can go down the line of all the things that we have never looked in the mirror on and, and said, uh, we need to fix that or we need to cop to that. And until we do that, I think we're going to just keep going along the fringes. So I think we have an important moment right now where we can make some change. I just hope we do it. We have we have a lot of uncomfortable conversations to have, not just in our households, but in our classrooms, in our uh, faculty meetings, in our boardrooms, in our uh, in the media. I mean, one of the most interesting things for me to watch over the last year has been the venomous response to the New York Times 1619 project, mm -hmm. which seeks to reckon with our history with slavery in this country way more directly and frankly and uncomfortably than the way we're accustomed. And seeing the just absolute explosion of hostility toward the editors of that project was very telling. And so when we talk about having uncomfortable conversations, not just with our teenage children or our racist uncles, like we have to have much bigger scale uncomfortable conversations, which can I point us to the next question, a, a question that's in the yes, Q&A? Christian, I, I, I don't know how where you land on this. One. I'm really interested to hear. Um, someone said, what are your thoughts about social media and shutting down a site like Parler? Is it worse for groups? to go even further underground. So where where are you on deplatforming? What do you think? Uh, I think it's really important what happened with Parler because Parler almost exclusively was a platform for extremism. It wasn't, you know, a place like Twitter where, you know, it's kind of mixed in with everybody. It was almost exclusively extremists there. So it was a communication vehicle uh, for them. It was a way for them to plan attacks. It was a, a way for them to spread propaganda it was akin to us shutting down like an ISIS communication network mm -hmm. uh, to a certain degree. Cause so many of the attacks that we've seen, not just in the last couple, in the last week, but in the last years have come from places like parlor, like gab uh, that they've been organized and, and, uh, and praised on there. So I think it was important to do that. Um, Cause I don't think we would be having this conversation if we were talking about some Brown people who committed some acts of terrorism, uh, we would all be shouting from the rooftops that we should, you know, shut the, down their communication networks and, and take away their ability to, to plan further attacks. So I think that that was a really, really smart thing or, you know, a lucky thing that happened. Um, Deplatforming, I think, has been very effective. Uh, but there are instances where, you know, deplatforming somebody, an individual, might send them further, you know, into isolation where those ideas become more attractive. And I think we have to take that, you know, we have to focus on individuals when it comes to that. But, you know, as far as organizations who are spreading hate, I have no issue with, with taking them down. Uh, these companies, these, these social media companies are a lot like, uh, you know, an apartment, like a landlord of a building or a property manager that, you know, has a you know, hundred tenants. These, these companies have millions and millions and millions of people they are larger than most nations. They have, you know, uh, they make more money than, than most countries have. Uh, but if they're treated like apartment buildings, if, you know, there's a tenant who is constantly setting fires in the hallway, who's, uh, you know, kicking in people's doors in the middle of the night, threatening them in the elevators, running, you know, after them with a knife, that you would, as a property manager, you would evict that tenant uh, for the safety of the other people, because it is a public square, these, yeah. these platforms. So, you know, it is really... Uh, it, you know they don't have uh, they don't have a right to up, you know, uphold free speech. They're public. They're private companies in most cases. They're not government entities, so they can do what they want. 
Uh, but I agree, uh, you know, when terroristic um, things are happening that we need to look at these platforms for what they are and they're just their platforms to continue that terror. I just want to take a second as an English teacher and appreciate that apartment building analogy and I'm going to steal that and use that in the future. Rachel, did you have a next question you wanted to go to? I'm just going to um, Yeah. Uh, well, here's one that I think is probably relevant to a lot of people. Um, many people are not extremists, but kind of sympathize with mm. some of them or excuse them or don't think they really pose a threat. The sympathetic ones are in the largest number. Do you agree? And what would you say to them? I, I do agree with that, actually. I do agree that most people, you know, that uh, you know, certainly 74 million people that, you know, voted for a fascist president are not necessarily all fascist but what i would say to that uh is that there were a whole lot of people that lived uh in germany during the 1930s and 40s uh who also went along with hitler but maybe you know never massacred a jew uh, but they went along with the program and they were complicit in furthering it and they kept their mouths shut and their neighbors were being rounded up and and, and uh killed uh in many cases uh, here's a good analogy, and, and I don't remember who, who said this, but I heard it from my wife. You know, they're at the Capitol building, let's say. Not everybody there was a Nazi, right? Not everybody there was a white nationalist. There maybe were some people there who, you know, were just Trump supporters who thought, you know, I'm going to go to another Trump rally. And maybe they didn't even go inside the Capitol building. Maybe they never left, you know, the lawn of where the rally was. A good indicator that you shouldn't be there is if there are Nazis there. If there are Nazis there, you probably want to reconsider the group that you're hanging around with, right? If there are Nazis hanging around at a rally and they're on, you know, kind of on the same side of the street where your people are, look around and reevaluate who you're standing next to because you may not be a Nazi, but you are adjacent to one. You're adjacent to somebody who is uh, willing to hurt other people because of what they look like, who they love, who they pray to, um, and you really need to evaluate that. So, you know, what I would say to all the Republicans, all the people who were there just to be, you know, quote unquote patriots, you may not be a Nazi, but there were a whole lot of Nazis there. And I, I really want you to reconsider, you know, who is part of this adjacent circle that you're hanging around. Um, hmm. Nothing really good comes from that. Um, kind of along those lines, I guess. Can I, um, can I answer one, Rachel? I saw one sure, here that please. I think is really important. Uh, Al asked it, and uh, he's a retired police sergeant from Milwaukee. Uh, in my estimation, Nora, feel free to answer this too if you want. Um, uh, how infiltrated are police departments in the US with white nationalists and white supremacists? Um, this is not a doomsday you know, kind of uh, scenario. I don't think that uh, you know, our, our police departments are full of secret Nazis, however, um, again, I would ask people to look around and see who they're surrounded with. And if there are people within their ranks, um, ask, they need to ask themselves if those are the kinds of people that they want to be with. If the kinds of actions that they're taking, if the, if the racism that they're seeing from you know, their fellow police officers um, is making them really question who they are, they really need to reconsider um, you know, who they're with and, and who they consider as brothers. How infiltrated is it? It's, it's impossible to say, but like the military or like any other, you know, profession that has the ability to cause trauma, police officers are very susceptible to these types of narratives. They're vulnerable to it, just like firefighters might be, or just like, uh, you know, um, prison guards or people who deal with, you know, kind of trauma all the time. Um, we need to be very, very careful because uh, extremists know to go to those groups uh, to, to recruit from those vulnerable people the same way they go to autism communities online or video games to look for young kids. They're looking for people who are searching for something and they're answering it with very, very fake promises. I would, I would speak to that from two very different angles in my response. One is that there was just an arrest from very near to where I live, um, someone who was in the Capitol building and posted pictures uh, who was also at all of the back the blue rallies in my community that have grown increasingly troubling and frankly turned into increasingly Trump rallies. Um, so there's that. 
But I'm also going to point out, I'm married to a first responder. My husband is a Chicago firefighter. And firefighters, police officers, paramedics, the military, uh, prison guards, as, as Christian mentioned, anyone who is in emergency response processes trauma every single shift. And we don't support them. This is where things like healthcare come in. If we don't have good physical and mental health care for everyone, especially though our first responders who are conditioned not to seek support and who are conditioned not to reach out and say like, I, I am, I'm in rough shape and I need help. Um, that makes them more vulnerable. I mean, they might have this strong community, but in that case, it's backfiring because it's a community that says, don't reach out for help. So when we have police officers who are overworked and understaffed and really struggling to understand their own you know, place in our society, especially over the past year, they are so susceptible right now. And so it's not, so, it's not just infiltration, it's a breeding ground from within as well if we're not supporting the men and women who do these jobs. Well put, yeah, very well put. Thanks. Maybe one more question, I think. Sure. Is yeah, there, it's, oh my gosh, it's 7.56. Is there one that you guys were drawn to in the Q&A? There's a lot of questions. Here's an interesting one. Christian sure. and Nora, you're both from the same neighborhood. How is it that you started out with such different perspectives? You wanna take that one? Um, sure, I saw swastikas spray painted on the sides of buildings in my neighborhood. And this is a library uh, event, so I'm not gonna swear, but I thought, what the heck? Um, that's, I was 13 when I saw that for the first time and I was horrified um, because I, I was raised to be pretty anti-racist and equally troubling to seeing the swastika was seeing nobody else bothered by it or people, and this goes back to that sympathizer question that someone asked earlier that was so good. I was like, what is happening? And the people around me were like, yeah. And that was it. And there wasn't a, there wasn't a big response. There wasn't, uh, nobody else was horrified. And so that horrified me even more. And that's how I got started. Yeah. See, unfortunately I was on the side of the people that were saying, you know, kind of don't look at it or don't bother with it. It'll go away. Um, you know, and, and if you've read my books to, you know, the folks on, on here, I kind of was raised in two different neighborhoods. I was kind of, didn't really fit into either one. So I, I, you know, while we grew up in the same area, um, you know, I really struggled with, with who I was within that community and within the other community that my parents had moved to. So I didn't know really who I was. So I was pretty, um, I was pretty, I was a really easy sell when somebody came to me and said, Hey kid, you know, you're important. Come here because nobody had really ever taught, taught me that or told me that before. Uh, and I always say this, you know, had somebody come up to me in that alley at 14 years old, instead of a skinhead, had it had been a baseball coach or, you know, a rock band or a group of ballerinas, I could have been the greatest dancer on earth. That just never happened. Uh, and instead, you know, a man named Clark Martell walked up to me in 1987 and, and changed my life. Um, and it turned out that that guy was America's first kind of neo-Nazi skinhead leader. Um, so we, we do need, you know, to go back to the earlier point, we need to look for the isolated kids before they go down that path. Uh, we need to, but we also, you know, more than that, we have to rid this country of the institutional and systemic racism that exists because that above all is a breeding ground for this racism. We have to turn off the bigots. Bigot. I would add one more thing to that and, <clears throat> and this to thank Rachel and the library again. We need to have more of these conversations in every imaginable space, in every community, with anyone who will hang out for an hour and talk about it. Because the more we get this out in the open and the more we have these both small and large scale conversations, mm -hmm. the, the easier it'll be to take on the bigger issues. Yeah, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Rachel and oh, Sherry. Thanks. Oh, yes, thanks, Sherry. Um, yeah, we're going to keep doing this. Um, and you know, we've gotten really great feedback from our community um, that this is what they want from their library. So um, we're definitely filling a need. So thank you for coming and taking your time to speak to us. Um, I know it's so valuable. Um, just to mention again, we're gonna send up a follow up email tomorrow. Um, look for that. Nora and Christian so kindly put together 
a bunch of resources um, if you're looking for further reading or just articles, um, things that you can use in your life or your work to combat um, extremism. Um, what else? I think that's it. If you want to buy the book, visit the bookstall website. That will be in the email too. I think that's it. And I would just say uh, on our link, uh, on our list of links will be Nora's toolkit. Make sure you check that out. It's free. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're going to link to the free radicals project. So um, if you're inclined to donate, which I, you know, hope you are, um, please donate to that anything else i think that's it it's always so awkward ending a virtual program have hope <laughs> have, have yes, hope thank you make it happen and uh let's not be afraid to to progress forward yeah thanks yes. so much everyone thank, thank you, you thanks, everyone Nora. thank you bye. thanks Christian bye, and Nora. thank you so bye. much bye, -bye.